We are at 11 o'clock, so let's get started. Welcome to the session. Um, I'm Dr. Nancy Chappell, your, your moderator for this presentation, and we're going to be um, taking a look at creating inclusive and accessible classrooms through open educational practices with Una Daly and Deborah Baker uh, of Open Education Global and Liz. Sorry, you're not on my list, but Liz as well. So, uh, I want you to know that the Wisconsin Open Education Symposium is committed to being a safe, accessible, equitable, and inclusive environment for all. Our code of conduct is in effect during this session and in all conference spaces. So please take a moment to reflect on how your actions can build up our open education community and support diverse voices. This session is being recorded and will be captioned for future viewing. Thanks for joining us today. Two other matters uh, fairly important. One is in the lower left hand part, part portion of your screen, you're gonna see the closed caption option. You can select that at any time. And on the lower right hand option of your screen is chat and feel free to enter comments, introduce yourself or questions there. We will be monitoring that. So without further delay, welcome. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Nancy. Um, we're, we're thrilled to be here with you this morning and thank you for choosing our session. Um, and I think we can go to the next slide, Debbie. Thank you. All right. Well, quick introduction. Um, I'm Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER at Open Education Global. And I'm thrilled to be here with my esteemed colleagues who will introduce themselves in a moment. But I want to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat window as well. We'd love to know who's here and um, maybe what role you have or what you teach um, if you're a faculty member. And Liz, on to you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> uh, apologies, I'm a little bit under the weather. So um, I'm sorry if I'm coughing or anything during this uh, webinar. Um, I'm the, I work with. Una at CCC OER, part of Open Education Global, and I'm the manager of CCC OER Communities, and I'm located in um, Southern California. But I did actually see snow. I just left our conference, uh, Open Education Global conference in Edmonton on Monday, and there was snow there on Monday. So um, I know that's what you're all dealing with in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, Debbie? Good morning. My name is Debbie Baker. I am the OER coordinator for the Maricopa Community Colleges in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm also the VP of membership for CCC OER, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. Right. Thank you, Debbie. Next slide, please. All right. Just very quickly for those of you who aren't familiar with the Community College Consortium for OER, and we abbreviate it CCC OER. It's quite a mouthful. Um, we're a community of practice, um, been supporting and encouraging colleges across North America in the collaborative development of open educational programs to ensure equitable access and success. And we've been doing this since 2007. So um, we and we have a lovely community um, with uh, folks from over 37. Well, 35 US states and 2 provinces in Canada as members, and we're super proud to have 7 Wisconsin technical colleges as members and through um, CVTC. Um, Chippewa Valley Technical College uh, um, maintains the consortium level, which provides um, a discount to any other Wisconsin technical college system that would like to become a member. Next slide, please, Debbie. All right, so very quickly, um, our agenda today, we're, we want to give you an overview of three practices that um, are really key to creating um, these inclusive and accessible classrooms um, and helping to create a sense of belonging for students as we know that's a key piece of um, student success. And so our areas are culturally relevant pedagogy and student voice, diverse scholarly voices and inclusive resources. After our overview, we are going to ask you to choose a breakout room to join us in, and we'll take a deep dive into one of those topics and you'll know ahead of time. <laughs> so choose ahead of time which uh, topic you would like. And then we're going to come back for the last few minutes and just have a wrap up. Um, hear what any kind of highlights you'd like to share. Next slide, please, Debbie. So our learning outcomes are associated around those practices. Um, 
um, helping you to ensure that your course design follows principles of UDL uh, to support diverse learners and how that can um, provide a culturally responsive learning environment, examining your discipline to include diverse scholars that might have been omitted, um, and how to contextualize your course materials um, through the use of diverse openly licensed images and case studies. Next slide, please. All right, so before we jump in, I know that this is an, um, an open education symposium, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about what are open educational practices, because this is an area that sometimes is um, it gets mowed over during um, OER discussions. And so I actually wrote it down because I, <laughs> there is a lot around it. It's really a set of beliefs and practices that center students and value their, their backgrounds, their ethnic and cultural backgrounds. And faculty who engage in this work collaborate with their students and offer them choices in the way that they can demonstrate their learning. Um, and this often looks like providing students with choices around projects that they create um, that are meaningful to them in their communities uh, or their disciplines and um, through open educational um, licensing and so forth, students can choose if they want to actually share these materials beyond the classroom. So it's, um, it's really a centered experience for students and a collaboration and empowerment. All right. Uh, the overview is over and off to Debbie to start to start her session. Okay, well, thank you, Una. Um, so I want to talk very, very briefly and very quickly about culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, this is one teaching approach which complements the adaptability encouraged within the use of open educational resources. So some of you may be familiar with the work of Zaretta Hammond and her book, Culturally Responsive Pedagogy in the Brain, wherein she describes three levels of culture, surface, shallow, and deep deep and provides two visual metaphors for that for culture a, a, an iceberg um, and a tree and those um those uh, those metaphors those two pieces um uh, across these three levels so as educators seeking to connect with students and be inclusive of cultural diversity surface level culture such as is found with food music dress and holidays is the most readily apparent and easiest to connect with think of this as the tip of an iceberg or the fruit of the tree and this level while important requires the least emotional commitment overall faculty and students the next level of culture is the shallow or intermediate level, and this is a much more challenging level to tap into. It, um, this level is messy and comprises unspoken rules of culture, such as personal space, concepts of time, eye contact, attitudes towards elders and teachers, social norms, which are embedded into how we conduct our everyday lives. Think of this as the part of the iceberg that is hidden just below the surface line or the branches and trunk of the tree. And bumping up against the shallow level, even inadvertently, can trigger both the student and the instructor to be suspicious, distressed, anxious, distrustful, etc. Crossing this line can be a difficult one to come back from. The deep culture level is the moral compass, unconscious knowledge and ways of thinking and being, our belief structure, ethics, and values. And think of this as the deepest, most hidden part of the iceberg or the root of the tree. And crossing this level, even unknowingly, can close doors or lead students to shut off and disengage from learning in the moment or perhaps even throughout the course and in the future. But tapping into these three levels of culture necessitates getting to know your students as individuals worthy of building a relationship with. The adaptability of OER makes it possible to spark imagination, connect emotion, to learning and with things like images, quotes, and poetry, and to draw connections between the current and prior learning and experience to foster an academic mindset. If you want to know more about culturally responsive teaching and open and how open education connects to that, um, there are a series of resources that were curated and collected by the open education community during Open Ed Week in 2023. Um, and uh, 
we'll we'll that that's linked here on the slides and we'll drop that link into the chat and it's also available in the breakout room um this work of con connecting uh open education and culturally responsive teaching was led by and continues to be managed by mit's open courseware program merlot and participating hbcus Okay, um, universal design is inclusive. Another teaching framework which works very well with the flexibility afforded by OER is universal design. You may have heard of universal design and or you might have heard it as universal design for learning, sometimes abbreviated to UDL. This is often viewed as the blueprint for accommodating students with disabilities. However, adopting a universal design for learning approach is a very inclusive approach. By definition, universal design, and here I'm thinking specifically about learning, optimize access to learning for all students, not only those with disabilities. At a high level, this is about providing multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. A universal design for learning means designing learning experiences ahead of time to maximize student access to and engagement with their learning. UDL includes providing captions on videos and alternative text on images, but goes far beyond those things. I'm going to give you a little tiny bit more about UDL. Um, so this is a screenshot of the entire framework, and I'm not, I don't expect you to read it or, or look at, at all the different bits and pieces on here, but simply to get a sense of the scope of the framework of universal design for learning. Um, the UDL framework includes 10 different ways to provide multiple means of engagement each of those with suggestions for specific instructional strategies. You'll notice the next column of multiple means of representation. This gives learners various ways of acquiring information and knowledge. The UDL framework includes 12 different ways to provide multiple means of engagement. Again, each of those with suggestions for um, specific instructional strategies. And then the last column, multiple means of action and expression, provides learners alternatives dem uh, for demonstrating what they know. This uh, column uh, the U of the UDL framework includes nine different ways to provide multiple means of engagement. Again, each of those with very specific ways to, to apply that to, to your instructional strategies. So as you look, I, I would encourage anybody who's not familiar with the larger universal design for learning to framework to um, go to the website that Liz has provided in the chat. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, and click through the website in order to see how each of these is defined, but even more how they, um, what instructional strategies are offered. Universal design for learning is based on the brain. It is based on brain science. And I'm going to give you a couple of different links here. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about how um, it is connected to the brain. And then, because I can't do three things at once, um, the, my last slide here is about student voice and choice. Um, so, again, looking at both culturally relevant pedagogy, universal design for learning, open educational resources and practices promote the use of and provide opportunities for student voice and choice in their learning. And these two concepts are intertwined and provide for inclusive practices, and they are embedded heavily in both culturally responsive pedagogy and universal design for learning. Um, so the adaptability uh, provided by the five R's of open education provides the flexibility, responsiveness, and agility to make changes in order to respond to student voice and provide for student choice. And now I'm going to turn this over to Una. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, thank you for that great overview. 
Um, and it was great to see in the chat window that um, from several of you who shared what your disciplines are that you teach, communications, early childhood education, and um, family and consumer services. Um, if others would like to share those, um, that would be wonderful too. So why diversify your scholarship sources? Um, scholars of from underrepresented groups are often missing from textbooks, but believe me, they're doing the work and you have to search a little harder to find that. Um, because it won't be in your um, traditional textbooks, um, but those are such important role models for your students. Um, it helps contribute to their sense of belonging that this is work that they can do too. Um, and it also count counteracts racist ideologists, ideologies and sexist ideologies that there's no, let's say there's no women doing STEM. Um, um, or uh, there's no uh, people of color who've uh, contributed to science. That's so untrue. And um, so it's it's so important to um, not for students from diverse backgrounds and those who may be from the dominant culture to know that um, and encourage students to share their voices. Um, I think Debbie mentioned this, that student voice is very important and they have um, valuable life experiences that they can contribute as well. All right, next slide, please. So I wanna give you a couple of examples from some of the wonderful um, faculty that we get to work with on one of our projects. Uh, this is from Dr. Melody Schmid, um, who's at one of our colleges out in California. And um, she, she tells her students, who does the science really matters? And often in a textbook, it looks like there's a single person that has a eureka moment and, oh, we get a new scientific theory. Well, in fact, science is done in teams and there's often disagreements back and forth. Um, and the background that someone brings to their science truly affects the outcomes and the quality of their research. And so it's so important that it's representative of our population. And we've seen this in, a, in quite a number of areas, medical textbooks that only um, speak about what happens with white skin, uh, experiments that are only done with white males. Well, that's, that's a, per, a percentage of our population, but it certainly isn't representative and it's dangerous uh, to have medical um, studies only done on such a small portion of the population. So she encourages her students um, to find diverse uh, biologists who resonate with them. And, and she has built this wonderful website and um, maybe Liz or Debbie can put the link in the, um, uh, in the chat window so you can see that, um, so you can see some of those wonderful resources. Um, next, next slide, please, Debbie. Um, this is an, another, um, a professor, uh, she's a professor of childhood development, um, specifically early education. And I noticed we had somebody from early education, so that was kind of fun. And so she asked her students, why are all the early education theorists white males? Um, and typically um, from European white male perspective. So think of Piaget, uh, Vygotsky um, and um, Dewey, John Dewey, which are all, you know, amazing uh, theorists, but there's, there's many more theorists and it's important that our students know about that. Um, next slide, please, Debbie. And so a few of these are uh, uh, Professor Kiy Kiyoko Kishimoto, who teaches at Min Minnesota State University, St. Cloud. Uh, there's Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. She's an American, um, pedagogical theorist and teacher, and she coined the term culturally relevant pedagogy over 30 years ago. So, uh, and, and finally, Dr. Paul Hernandez um, is a nationally recognized leader in college access and success. He has several books out. Um, these are all educators from diverse backgrounds who are doing cutting edge work and our students need to know about them. Next slide. Finally, I want to hats off to College of DuPage. They have uh, on their library, um, and if, I, I think maybe many of you are familiar with College of DuPage. They're in Illinois. They're just outside of Chicago in um, Ellen, Glen Ellen. Um, and they have a whole web page devoted to finding scholarship written by diverse authors. And um, We'll put the link in that in the chat window in a little bit, but it's uh, really an opportunity for you to find these resources if you'd like to introduce them into your classroom. And I think uh, that's my last slide. Thanks, Anna. And <clears throat> I did put that um, link to the College of DuPage site in there for you. Thanks so much. Um, so, hi everyone. 
So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about contextualization. Um, so this is relating subject matter content to basically the students' lives. It makes it more relevant um, to them. It, it's more likely to engage them and increases their confidence. Um, uh, so uh, ne next slide. Thanks for putting the link in, Debbie. Um, so one one way to provide contextualization is through diverse images, um, and and there there are a lot of important reasons to do this. One is um, representational justice. If you're not familiar with that, so, uh, from a paper by Sarah Lambert, um, it's the self determination of marginalized people and groups to speak for themselves and not have their stories told by others. Um, and also, but also in addition to that. Providing diverse images um, increases the knowledge, engagement, and accurately reflects, reflects the world, as Una um, referred to um, in a study found that only 4.5% of textbook images in the American Academy of Dermatology study had dark skin. This is obviously dangerous um, that doctors are being trained with um, limited uh, examples. Um, next slide. So what do we mean by diverse images? So it's you know race and ethnicity, gender, um, just all 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 sorts of different things to think about. And here are a few um, a few examples, all openly licensed. Um, next slide. Um, so. You might be thinking, well, that's all very well and good, but where do I find good resources for finding diverse images? And actually, um, I don't know if if you guys are on our community, um, CCCOR's community email list, but this was a, a topic brought up a couple of years ago now, um, and quite a few people had ex examples. And um, these are a few that you might, some of them, um, you know, are you probably know of. I just want to highlight a couple that are quite a little bit different, like um, Wiki Loves Africa is an annual public contest um, where people across Africa contribute media. Um, and I liked this picture because it's a, a woman um, looking into getting trained on using a microscope. And another one that's a little bit different is um, illustrations that you can download this whole um, set of illustrations and mix and match them in your Oh, they think so. Um, it makes them match them. Um, and I have there's a whole um, handout which Debbie put the link to in the chat, um, which with ha with a lot more um, resources. This is also something that's come up on um, OEG Connect, which is the uh, forum for Open Education Global. So there's a a wiki um, post there that people can update. Um, next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one more, one previous. Um, so, um, in addition to just providing different images, there's also a case studies. So these examples are from a webinar that we held a couple of years ago about how Butte College updated some case studies in a human um, biology textbook. So next slide. Um, so the before. This is a screenshot from the course. Um, the the case study is about high heels um, and the picture just shows one person with light skin um, and the case study um, uses a name that that is often thought of as maybe a white or European name um, and the next in the next slide shows how it was updated with a different image showing a, a couple different people um, the case study is largely the same but the name has been changed and the person in the example uses um, different pronouns. Um, yeah, and then um, related to this is localization. Um, this example is from California, which is where I'm based, and it's about water. Obviously, water um, supply and demand looks very different in California than it does in Wisconsin, and so. Um, this example would be different for Wisconsin. Uh, so, as an example of localization in this textbook, um, there's a picture of the Los Angeles uh, aqueduct, and there's also 
um, the examples that they use are things like the Los Angeles aqueduct, the Colorado aqueduct, et cetera, things that are relevant to the students of the College of the Canyons, which is um, located near um, Los Angeles in Southern California. The last one is um, from Arizona. It's a geol geology textbook. Um, so in addition to the text, the, there are case studies throughout the text with local examples. This one is a screenshot talking about uranium in the Grand Canyon, um, talking about how uranium mining has affected the Native Americans in the area, and also providing context of why uranium would be in demand because of the Cold War. So this, um, you know, this brings it home, hopefully, for students in Arizona. And I believe that is my last slide. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> And Debbie, um, so at this point, um, we're um, going to um, open up the breakout rooms. Um, I'm not sure, is, is Rachel here to help with that? Rachel is here. <laughs> okay. And I don't know how to get into a breakout room, but we want you to choose um, the breakout room where you would like to dig a little bit deeper. Um, and um, where are the breakout rooms shared? <laughs> I don't see them here. I'm sorry to be so new oh, to and weather. I don't see Rachel, but she was oh, here. She was here. Okay. All right. We're going to do this. We're going to get this right. Okay. Thanks. So, um, we've got how many people? 18, three rooms. Is that you want yes. three rooms? Okay. So, so Nancy, if you just create three rooms, um, and leave them open so anybody can join any room, that would be. So I've created a breakout session, three rooms, and I'm not assigning anything. Yep. Right. So and so. Are they numbered 1, 2, 3 or something like that? They're numbered yes. 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, so that so we can assume that they correspond to the bullets then. So, okay. um, let's, so let's, do, <laughs> let's do breakout room 1 would be finding inclusive resources. With Break, Liz. With Liz. Yeah. So breakout room 2 will be student voice and choice. That'll be with me, Debbie. And breakout room 3 will be diverse scholarship with Una. Yeah, and I and don't so, know how to get there. So <laughs> it, as soon as Nancy opens them, it'll show up in the participant list. The attendees is that? What? Yeah, yeah. Wait, so if you don't look on the assigned. Gotcha. Yeah, that's fine. So people just choose which one yeah. to join. Yeah, okay. perfect. Thank so you. So they're open. Does anybody see anything? Yeah, so if you look at the participant list on the Right above the chat, if you open that, at the very top, it, there's a, a message. It says breakout sessions have started. You can join any sessions and then a link to show all breakout sessions. Right. Thank you, Debbie. Okay. So, Una, <laughs> you're going to go ahead and, and so if you open that, you'll see a joint. Yeah, she's got it. Okay. All right. Nancy, you got this. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> what would we do without you? No worries. <clears throat>
And we're back. All right. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was that was quite an experience. It's interesting. <laughs> Chantal and I had to communicate over text and and chat, um, but it all it all worked out great. All right. So let's go to the our wrap up slide, please, Debbie. All right. We have uh, two minutes for highlights. <laughs> Would anyone like to share? Um, any of our attendees like to share what they learned in the in their breakout room or any any comments in general? You can unmute yourself, I believe, at this point, right, Nancy? Should be able to absolutely. Okay, we yeah, go ahead and just unmute. I know we've we're running late, so. Well, Debbie or Liz, would you like to share what came up in your rooms? Sure. Um, so we had some great um, conversations um, again via chat um, about um, options for, for voice and choice and some of those options revolved around um, discussion prompts, but also providing options of um, 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 some choice in what students um, complete assignments about. Um, so choosing topics, for example, within a specific area. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. Liz. Um, yeah, so I share I just shared the link in this chat um, for anyone who wasn't in the breakout room um, is a collection of sites of diverse images. These have been collected by the open education community. It started out on our community email list and it's um, become, gone global with OEG Connect. Um, when we did have one question about sites focused on finding images of of Hispanic people or Latinx is, is more commonly used in California. Um, and I don't have one. There's a lot that say black and brown people, but I don't know of any that are specific to Hispanic images um, or you know, sites or collections. So um, thank you for that question. It's definitely something I have to look for. Um, especially being from California. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Liz. That's something we'll need to enhance our our um, our list. That's the, thank you. And I had a great session with Chantal <laughs> Hampton, but we couldn't quite speak to each other about finding resources for family, um, for child and family uh, relations, I believe. Um, so wonderful. Um, next slide, Debbie. I think we're just gonna wrap up here um, and big thanks to, um, Nancy for uh, being our moderator. Uh, join the CCCOER community. That's our free email list. We have monthly webinars. We invite everyone from the open education community. We publish case studies. We have an equity book club in the summer. Um, and um, if you become a member as seven other technical colleges in Wisconsin have, we have conference discounts and other benefits where um, you can help drive our agenda uh, around open ed and how we support our colleges. So thank you all for coming. Uh, it was an amazing um, symposium so far and um, hope to see you in some other sessions. Thanks everybody.